welcome to Barbell Logic Rewind. It's Barbell Logic time again. I'm Scott Hambrick and I'm with Matt Reynolds. And this one is going to be about block, which is something that we often use for people who are, in fact, advanced trainees. A little recap we talked about how an intermediate might use heavy light medium. And Texas method, in my opinion, is a heavy light medium variant. But it might be just strict heavy light medium, as you would see in practical programming. And then as they keep going, as the trainee keeps going, they can't make progress on weekly heavy light medium anymore. And so sometimes we'll stretch it out. Often we'll stretch that heavy light medium to take them two weeks to get a PR. Yep. And they'll get a five rep PR every other week. And then that gets to be pretty tough. And then I'll have them do over two weeks. They'll get a five rep PR. And then the next week, they'll put a little more weight on the bar and get that for three reps. Yep. And then that doesn't work. And then maybe they'll go and we'll get a five rep PR. Two weeks later, get a three rep PR. Then two weeks later after that, we get a one rep PR. And then next time, next cycle, they get the what was their three rep PR for five. Yep. And then that becomes a new five rep PR. And we just ladder up. And then that doesn't work. So you're making progress weekly, then you're making progress every two weeks, then you're making progress every three weeks. And really, it still might be weekly progress, but the idea is we can quantify that the PR is going up quantifiably, where we have something to compare it to every mm-hmm. three weeks now. And then we're about to go to every month, right? Every right. four it's, weeks well, or whatever. And then it's every six weeks. Yep. And then it starts getting a little bit uglier. Then we might want to add another week in there. So you got a three-week heavy light medium, maybe. Sure. But uh, by this point, we probably need a deload week. And so I might cut off the heavy and go straight to the light week. So wait a minute, let me rephrase this. So we might cut off the, the, the heavy volume there. And now we're going to, we're going to have a light session, a light week followed by a medium week, followed by heavy week, a low stress week, right? The better way to say it than light, right? So at this point, we're moving into something that's about maybe a six to eight week program yep. at this point, And it looks like a really simple block. Yep. Then that doesn't work and we can expand that. So it takes longer to accrue the stress and we get more time to dissipate the fatigue at the end of the cycle. And then you're in like a standard 10 or a 12 week block as prescribed by Soviets. Yep. Or Matt Reynolds. Yeah. Well, I mean, I just stole it from the Soviets. Right. Gosh, I hope that made sense. You know, there's no visual aids here on the, on the podcast. I hope that made some sense, but hopefully we can elucidate a little bit more about what that looks like. Yeah, no, it's good. I mean, we really kind of know that almost everybody gets to a four-day split kind of in mid-intermediate training. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, as soon as one of my clients says, I kind of like to train four days and they're past the basic LP, I'll let them train four days. You bet. Right, because I can do four-day heavy light medium. I can do four-day Texas method. I can, you know, that's not hard to do. And block training is really the most advanced four-day split that you can do, probably. A true four-day split, right? What does advanced mean? Well, I just mean like it's a long program. It takes a long time. It needs, you know, 10, 11, 12 weeks of lead time to mm-hmm. hit PRs. But certainly the way block was written by the Soviets, it was a pretty traditional four-day split. It was two upper mm-hmm. body days, two lower body days, Right. We've modified it some over time. We tend to like maybe an extra press or bench press in there. We'll get there here in a minute. But the general idea is that you have a block of training that could be anywhere from one to four weeks that starts with an accumulation phase. It's just a phase that you are building or accumulating work capacity. You're just doing a lot of work. They're blue collar days. They're not hard. They're not super hard. I mean, they can be somewhat stressful, but they're stressful because of the volume, not because of the intensity. Just a bunch of work, man. We will talk about how we try to manipulate intensity a little bit when we get in there, because I do think that if we just do, we've talked about this a lot. I think if we just do that volume work without any of the intensity, it's too hard to go to heavy if you haven't done heavy for a long time. So we, we have some things we do. So that accumulation phase is just a high volume phase. The percentages are in mostly in the 70s. So what are we accumulating, do you think? Are we accumulating work capacity? Or are we accumulating fatigue? I actually think you're accumulating both. Yeah, yeah. I do too. So both accumulate. Yeah, you're accumulating both work capacity in over the course of two, three, four weeks, you're accumulating fatigue. Do you think it's a good idea to accumulate fatigue? Yes. Why is that? Because of Hans Selye. 
I, right. At some point, I want enough because I have to take my body to a fatigue point that it hasn't been at before that it can still recover and get stronger without the without the response where it like wants to shrivel up and die. Right. We play a semantics game in the strength and conditioning periodization world that I don't necessarily want to get in the semantics game, but in order to help people understand, there is obviously a line between what the strength and conditioning world tends to call overreaching, mm -hmm. which is clearly fatigue is accumulating. I cannot recover from session to session. And from session to session and week to week, I'm actually having more fatigue present and I'm less and less recovered. At some point, I actually cross a line into what, again, most people in strength and conditioning call overtraining, which is now I can't actually make progress. Right. My body will not recover and adapt anymore. It's going to sort of shut down and it's going to take a long time. And once I recover from the overtraining, I'm actually, I've actually lost fitness. I haven't gained, right? I've lost strength, not gained. Mm -hmm. But you get to the point where during the novice phase, you build up fatigue on Monday. You completely recover from it in the next 36 to 48 hours, and you're ready to go again on Wednesday. By the end of the novice phase, you're not able to do that, right? So the fatigue, this is troubling. Okay. Bit. I mean, not really. But when I'm programming, you know, I've got goals in mind, sure. right? And so is there a difference if the goal in mind is to help the trainee develop more work capacity or if the goal in mind is, you know, I need to pile the work on this person in order to fatigue them? I think you just maybe move a little slower if the goal is to never add fatigue. Just go real slow to make sure that the person can continue to recover. I mean, at some point, I also think that the goal is not just to fatigue them, right? I can go and I could just have them do it. Yeah, you could just drive them into the ground. On the first three days. Right. They, or right on the edge of overtraining. So yeah, you're actually playing a happy medium between the amount of work that must be performed. So the total amount of stress that's being done. So I'm playing man in the street here, right? Yeah, right. I get it. So I think that we're actually trying to accumulate the work capacity. That's what I think we're doing. And we watch to see how much fatigue they're accumulating in order to measure how we're doing here. Yeah. You know, I don't want to push the guy too far, but if he's not fatigued, then he could do more, do more work. work. That's right. And, you know, so we're going to do a block of this accumulation and it's going to be, uh, it's going to be roughly four weeks, right? It can yeah. be something like that. Yep. It's going to be like five sets of five. Again, it depends on the person and how fast they're accumulating fatigue and how well they can handle the work. So it's probably somewhere in the ballpark of five sets of five on most of the main lifts, right? Followed by a supplemental lift. So you've got your main squat day. You're going to squat like five sets of five somewhere in that ballpark. And then it's going to follow up with a supplemental deadlift. Right. The other lower body day is the same, only it's now a competition deadlift for five sets of five or four sets of five and a supplemental squat. Same thing for press and bench press. Yeah. If you're programming for an animal, it might mean they squat, then they do, you know, supplemental deadlift of some sort, rack pull or whatever. Yeah. And then they may squat again. <laughs> yeah, we do that some, but not that often. I do that. You've had me do it. But not on block, work. on DP. No, you've had me do it on block, I'm pretty sure. I don't think so. Yeah. I wrote the program. I've done it this year. Have you? Yeah, yeah and maybe. I haven't done DP this year. Um, Certainly yeah, do it on DP. It smells terrible. You smell, the whole room stinks now. It's a little room. There's a little, not much air supply. I just added some air in the room. <laughs> I can taste your... <laughs> oh, no. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> oh, no, curry. Yeah, it tastes like curry. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> so the other piece of this is if what we're trying to do is, there's two things that kind of change with block training. You have a block of accumulation that's high volume, Moderate intensity. Intensity is in the 70s. Followed by, what are you doing? I gotta open this door. It's so bad. Did you fart again? No. <laughs> it's so bad. Carry on. All right, so you have the accumulation phase where for a few weeks you've got relatively high volume, moderate intensity. Intensity is in the 70s range. Followed by a supplemental lift. In the accumulation phase, I want the supplemental lift to be full range of motion or more than full range of motion because I'm accumulating work. Right. So uh, we're talking about deficit deadlifts. We're talking about tempo squats or pause squats. We're talking about close grip bench presses, big giant range of motion right. because I want lots of work. Work equals force times distance. You want D to be mighty big. Correct. So for almost all of the supplemental lifts during the accumulation phase, the weight that they're going to be handling on the supplemental lift will be less than the weight they handle on the main lift. And you do that for about three to four weeks. That's a block, the accumulation block. Then 
It's almost always followed up by a deload. The deload, we tend to, because the volume has been high and the intensity has been just moderate, when we deload after the accumulation phase, we keep the intensity moderate. We don't drop the intensity much or any. We drop the volume significantly, so like three sets of three, two sets of three, something like that. So they still get decent work in. And we continue the work on the supplemental lift because the supplemental lift isn't heavy enough, so it doesn't matter. By that time, the volume has been peeled off of that, and the supplemental lift is getting decently heavy. But overall, if you look at the stress of a deload week, because the intensity stays moderate on the main lift, moderate to high on the supplemental lift, and volume is low across the board, the total stress is relatively low. Make sense? It does. All right. Then we move into the second phase of block training, which is the transmutation phase, or the... What's the other word for that? I don't know. Sublimation? No. Sublimation? No. It's the uh, accumulation. It's realization. <laughs> yeah, where we start to transmute our work capacity into the ability to exert more force. So, you know, how does that work? I'm not really sure. You know, is it that we just start practicing singles again? Is that what it is? Well, or is there actually some sort of biological process whereby you can turn five sets of fives into three triples. You know what I mean? Yep. Like, what the hell is happening? I don't know. I don't I, either. I don't know. If any, I don't, how can anybody say they know? Hubris? <laughs> I guess. Hubris. I'm not going to be so arrogant to say that I know what's going on. Something happens between the accumulation phase and the transmutation phase, but here's the primary thing that happens. It's called transmutation. I don't know that that's actually what happens. You're tapering in volume and driving the intensity up. Well, you're not really tapering yet. You are, but stay with me. Let's think about it from a stress perspective. Mm -hmm. For the stress perspective, if you continue this sort of high, low, medium idea, accumulation is the medium. Right. Transmutation is the high. Because intensity continues to drive up from moderate to moderate high. And volume goes from high to high moderate. So now both intensity and volume are sort of moderate high during the transmutation phase, which means stress is really high. Yeah, so instead of doing five sets of five, when you're in transmutation, you're going to start with four fours. Yep, four or, sets or, of four. Or, or maybe like three fours and a big heavy single yep, or something like that. That's you're gonna exactly right. 12, 14, 15 reps And they're most. in the 80% range. So like week one, here's like, you know, 80% for four, 85% for four, 90% by one. And then 82 and a half for two sets of four. Yeah. Now, right. so at these intensity levels that we're talking about, when their accumulation starts down in the 70s and then transmutations up into the 82 and plus, we end up at 87, 89, I don't know, towards that last week of transmutation, which again is a four week deal. Yep. Doesn't block, does not work for old people. I've never had an old person do block. Well, I mean, right. You know, we've had these long, long discussions over the course of years at this point about, you know, volume and intensity and yep. all that stuff. What's the youngest person or the oldest person you've ever had run block? How old was that person? I mean, I think a guy like a Frank Sanders could still probably run it. Like you, you would always find those guys that are like really good athletes and really strong who are in their former seal <laughs> and they're right. Former seals are in their fifties. You know, guys like that, I think you could you could see that. But, you know, outside of that, I think your standard guys, I think 40 is probably the line. Yeah. 40, 41, 42. Start. I mean, it really depends on the individual. I want to be careful drawing lines. But sure. The right. point is, in general. They will detrain during the accumulation phase. Yep. Even if they could stay healthy, you know, not get yep. the flu, not go on vacation, and actually string together 12 weeks. Yep. There is a group of people who will detrain in accumulation. Correct. So not everybody can do it. Nope. Just nope. wanted to say that. Yep. So you do a transmutation phase. The intensity goes up. The volume comes down, but just a little bit. Mm -hmm. In general, it's real stressful. It's hard to recover from. The supplemental lifts become a little more partial. So on presses, you go to like press lockouts, but still kind of big press lockouts. So press lockouts are like from the top of the head or the forehead, not from like three inches of lockout. Bench press is a like a paused competition bench press like a two count pause. So it's still pretty heavy. The other one's probably a floor press, something like that. So floor press, most people, when they start a floor press, they do a little less than the bench press. And by the time they get done doing floor press for three, four, five weeks, it's a little more than the bench press or somewhere in that ballpark. So you've got some things. If you do a deficit deadlift, 
then you would reduce the amount of deficit that's on there. You might do a low rack pull. You might do a pause deadlift, something like that. Are you reducing the range of motion in order to put more weight on the bar? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The goal is just to put more weight on the bar. The weight on the bar on the supplemental lifts also go up, as does in the competition <laughs> lift. I mean, we're working towards a peak, right? So it just makes sense. As a side note, we do on a four day split for almost all four day splits we do, there's a fair amount of accessory work. On upper body days specifically, you're going to do some back work. You're going to do some tricep work. You're probably going to do some bicep work, extra slots, hypertrophy, additional stress without really screwing up your joints and your bones. <laughs> you know, and your bones. You know, try not to break. We want to not screw up people's bones. Yep, and usually not much in the way of accessory movements on the lower body days. The lower body days are tough enough. Real heavy squats and real heavy deadlifts on the same day you're really probably done. You're going to have, I don't know, six or seven sets for squats and deadlifts on those. Deal, and that's yep. going to be plenty. Yep. And then we do realization. We do another deload, right? Another so deload. there's that's always right. another deload. And the way I write the deload is on that deload, you're going to hit a single, like somewhere between 90 and 92%. So it's pretty damn heavy on deload week. And then you're going to do a set of three or a couple sets of three in the like mid 80s, 85, 86. So that's also still pretty damn heavy, but it's just not very much volume. Not so much. Like volume's low single and a triple or single and two triples your supplemental lift by that time you know you're doing a single at the floor press lockouts or you know you might end up doing a total of like three or four work reps total reps some accessories and then yep then we go into realization right hmm. oh the other word for um transmutation is the intensification phase that is unacceptable transmutation like is also known as intensification and i that's probably a better word why don't we just call it heavyfication? Heavyfication? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I don't like that. That was, sounds like my honeymoon. There's a lot of heavyfication going on. Huh. I didn't have a honeymoon. <laughs> it's because you were working. That's true. <laughs> so the question is, what's happening during transmutation slash yeah. intensification phase? Well, the stress goes up. And the stress goes up enough that what typically happens is in week one of transmutation, you're like, this is awesome. Right. And then week <laughs> two, you're like, uh, this is not awesome. Oh, no. And in week three, you're like, oh, my God. Yeah. This sucks. And remember, you have four workouts. So you realize it sucks on workout one of the third week of transmutation. You're like, oh, my God. And I've still got three workouts left. Oftentimes, people will get a five rep and three rep PRs in transmutation phase. On the first week. <laughs> yep. And then they do okay on the second week, and then they damn near die on the third. They don't damn near die. Get it? You guys take me so seriously. Oh my all god! The time. Right? But you get it right. So you clearly have built up fatigue. You got tremendous fatigue at the end of that transportation phase. You're like, I need a deload. I need a deload. This is not going to go well. I'm a month out from my meet. It's Thirty <laughs> days out. Right. What have you done to me? This is bad. I remember Michael Burgos telling me that Michael Burgos is like, mm -mm, this is not good. This is not good. Right. And then you deload. Yeah. And the deload's still pretty damn heavy. And the deload goes okay, and you feel a lot better on the deload, and you get excited, and you go to that first week of realization or peaking. It's awful. So you're going to do ascending singles. And you do 91% for a single <sighs> and like 94 and 97. And you got two more weeks. You're like, sometimes you miss it, the 97. Yeah, it's... Or the 96 or, you know, whatever that is. Yeah, and so by the time somebody gets here... And their squats are damned heavy. They're heavy. And they're not fully recovered yet. And, and they're not, not fully, fully peaked. And you right. have to remind people, like, it's okay. And they do 97%. And a 97% is like an RPE 10. Uh, so heavy. For a lot of guys, it's, you know, it's way, 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 way north of 400, 500. Yeah, right. you know? It's heavy, heavy weights. You know, so 97%. Yeah, it's brutal. And then they'll have back offs too. And then the volume starts coming down and the weight well, just goes up from there. Well, and remember too, though, and the weight on the supplemental list become really heavy. So now press lockouts are like three inch press lockouts. Yeah. At over your PR. Over your PR. And your bench press is like a slingshot bench press. And the deadlift is like a higher rack pull, not an above the knee rack pull because I think those are worthless, but still a below the knee rack pull, but like a just below the knee rack pull. Right. And it's real heavy. In the first week, your that rack pulls the same weight as your deadlift, or even a little bit less. But by the second and third week of that rack pull, you're rack pulling fifty pounds more than your deadlift. Yeah, hundred and five percent. That's right. Ouch. Like that becomes, that's right. That's right. Where we'll do stuff too, like those big heavy walkouts. We'll do those press starts. You know, things like that work really, really well. Speaking of walkouts, I want to go back to the heavyfication phase. 
We need to really... The transmutation phase? Yes. Okay. We're not going to get the answer on this, but let's just spitball and talk about what might actually be happening there. Okay. So you, you, if somebody... Well, I'll just talk about me. If I'm just doing a bunch of fives, uh, you know, heavy, you know, even triples or singles are shocking to me, you know, and as people get stronger, um, particularly for men, the spread between their five, their three and the one opens up. Yep. And, you know, so a big component of what's going on in the transmutation phase is we're just starting to practice doing heavies again. Yep. There's just a practice element. What else do you think is going on? Do you think that biologically, I mean, we don't have any research here. Biologically, can we actually convert the work capacity into force production somehow? I don't know. Probably not. It doesn't seem like it. But it's not work capacity. It's work, right? We know that we've trained with high volume to drive the stress during the accumulation phase. And what is actually transitioning during transmutation is that you're going from a volume stressor in accumulation to an intensity stressor in peaking Hmm. And during the transmutation, you're really moving from one to the other as the primary stressor. Yeah, so maybe they're not even named properly. Yeah, I don't think it's named properly. That name is stolen from the Soviets. That's a translation of the Soviet word. So maybe then what's happening is... Transition phase. We use, well, we use volume as a stressor for as long as we can. Like if we did it for nine weeks, you'd overreach maybe, right? Sure. Then we stop that, and now we use intensity as a stressor. Yep. And of course, you can't do that forever either. Nope. And then you deload. Yeah, so I've actually done it back-to-back -back accumulation phases where they do an accumulation block followed by a deload, mm -hmm. followed by another accumulation block. Yeah. I've also done accumulation block followed by a deload to a transmutation block to deload back to an accumulation to a deload back to transmutation and then a peak, right? I've done both those. I've done that because somebody missed. I've just done that sometimes when I've got like a really high-end lifter. Like back with, I did that with Jillian Ward mm. back when I trained with her because we were laying out her training 24 weeks in advance. And you could see that she could do it. Yeah, and at 24 weeks, what am I going to do? Do you want me to actually peak her 12 weeks out from Worlds? Like right. that's dumb. No, let's just, let's just get a bunch of good work in. Let's keep driving up the stress. Let's get her f pretty damn heavy at the end of transmutation one. <laughs> transmute one, transmute two, transmute three. And then three. we deload, and then we go to accumulation two, and then transmutation two, and then we peak the thing, right? And so it works fine. I think people are looking at it wrong when they actually think, can volume actually transmute to intensity? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't know. I, I don't know. No, I don't think so. My hunch, and it's only a hunch, is that we can use volume as a stressor that will disrupt homeostasis. We have our adaptation, and it carries over to some degree to create strength sure. adaptation. Sure. We know you can get strong from volume, and you can get strong from intensity, but you can't do either very long to keep right. driving the strength. Right. So at some point, and again, there's lots of arguments on the internet about exactly what order you do this in. I still continue to come back to if you just train consistently and focus on a really good form, probably really doesn't matter if you drive volume first and intensity second or intensity first and volume second or more volume and then intensity or more intensity yeah. and then volume. Does it really actually matter? Well, at some point we have to have a podcast about it and we're talking about the thing, so sure, let's talk about it. But here's the deal. What we know is you can't go, no one that argues for volume would tell you to squat five sets of five on the squats the week before the meet. Right. Why? Well, you're not getting the practice. You're not getting the practice. Like, there has to be some amount of heavy lifting to get good at heavy lifting. Yeah, heavy lifting is a skill in and of itself. That's right. And it's enough stressor to drive an adaptation. That's maybe another place that there's some disagreement on the internet is that is heavy alone enough of a stressor to drive an adaptation? And the answer is clearly from my experience is yes. For I've certain populations. Hundreds and hundreds of people. Yeah, of course. Will it work forever? No. Literally the exact same argument for volume. Right. Does volume make you strong? Yes. For how long? Not forever. Yeah. I don't know, man. So what block does is it takes you through both. You start with volume. You get all this work in. You kind of lay the foundation. You lay the bricks down and put the mortar on the brick and put it down. And you just do the thing. And you're just punching your... Almost every workout in accumulation is a blue-collar day. Not because you feel bad and you don't want to do it. Just, it's just a lot of work. And there's nothing really that heavy. It's heavy enough. You're going in. You're like, damn. Like, man, I can remember doing accumulation phases that had like seven sets of five on deadlift. I don't typically write that for my clients, but this is stuff that was written to me by Jeremy Frey, who learned it from 
Ishurin and Bondarchuk and the elite FTS guys back in the day and all that kind of stuff. And so, man, we would do lots of sets of five on deadlifts with like 575. Ugh, ugh. It was no fun. No. But, there, but it was doable. Like, it wasn't like, nothing was just like brutal. We were all like well over 700 pound deadlifters at the time. So it wasn't that big of a deal. So we transmute, weight continues to go up, volume peels off slowly, intensity goes up a little quicker deload come back to that realization phase now it's time to peak now what are we trying to do with realization well now we're actually trying to drive the weight on the bar up while getting rid of fatigue mm -hmm. we built up fatigue in transmutation phase we know we have an excess of fatigue present in the body the one week deload alone doesn't get rid of it all and I have to be able to get better at just really heavy weight on my back and in my hands now. And so I strip tons of that volume off. I drive the intensity up as fast as I can. I also continue to play the intensity game in the supplemental list by making the supplemental list really heavy. And so I go real heavy, you know, slingshot, bench press, rack pulls, high press lockouts, things like that. Pin squats. Pin squat is probably the one type of squat that you can really do much heavier than a normal. It could be a chain squat too, mm -hmm. like something like that, where it's you do a chain squat with almost as much weight as you can actually squat. But I like a pin squat there and you drive up and you go, you know, that first week in, in realization, mm. you hit like 96, 97%. And then the next week you hit like 98, 99%. And then you go for PRs, which may be a test week. Or you may go for hitting 100%, 102 if the thing's gone really well, and then take another deload week and do the meet. Right. Or you may not do this 102 week at all. You may finish with the 90. In. Yep, deload and then go to the meet. Like any of those are fine. The general idea is that in that realization phase, you just peel off the volume, drive up the intensity, recover as much as you can, and get real good at handling real heavy weights. And then time to roll. Yeah. What else could you do? Well, for programming. Uh, yeah. I mean, well, <laughs> there's other things, but I mean, I do think this is the next, like, well, we've always talked about block training as being this like super advanced program. I think it just needs to be this continuation of the minimum effective dose of complexity, which is what you laid out at the beginning of the show and what you've laid out in previous programming shows. Like, man, it's just, I don't know how you end up not getting here if you're a good enough athlete and your body can handle getting here. Like if you train with consistency and you're 33 years old, right, you're going to end up doing this. Yeah, Everybody's going to start at LP and everybody's going to get to some sort of heavy light medium combination Texas method type style. To a four-day split, Texas Method style, to a four-day split, two-week progress, to a four-day split, three-week progress, and you do that rotation, fives, threes, and ones. So the next thing you know, man, I'm on a six-week, eight-week block. This doesn't have to be 12 weeks. No. Nope. Right? Yep. And in your Jillian example, it was hmm, 24 yeah, weeks, 24, 24 weeks. It all works. So the idea is like we lay the groundwork with accumulation. We build the stress that must truly be recovered from. We try to get into an overreaching sort of stage in the transmutation phase, and then we peek it all out in the final phase. And that doesn't take very long. The final phase, two weeks is often enough, two, three right. weeks max. I think five-week peak is too damn long, so... God, I dread that so much. But listen, it's actually terrifying. I've had this happen to me before, running too long of a peak. Somebody peaks on week two, and the meet's not till week four. Right. We hit real big PRs, like 14 days out. Uh-oh. Yep. Uh-oh. I screwed it up. Yep, and I've done that before. And you go, damn it. And then they go to the meet, and they don't perform as well as they did two Fridays before. Right. Well, that's on me, probably. Right? Now, what's really on me is if I do it again with the same person. Right. Because at some point, like the first time you do the thing, you just don't know. Yeah, so if somebody is able to get a PR two weeks out, this means that they could have taken a little bit more stress. Yeah, so I don't know if they get a PR, it's wrong, right? So I've had, especially females on this program, just the very potential of PRs two weeks out doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. But if you hit two weeks out and you're hitting big PRs and you're a really advanced lifter and the PRs are really big and really hard. A big giant guy. Yeah. It's like a, a 585 squat or 605 squat. Yeah, it's pretty squat. rare that you'll see. So, yeah, if you see somebody squat 600 for the first time, two weeks out from meet, they've never squatted 600 <laughs> and they squat 600, they're probably not squatting 600 at the meet. Yeah. And so it's a little better to kind of hold that back. So the way it's written, the way we do it, the way the kind of template is written and the program that we use here, and we, of course we tweak all these to, to modify them for each individual lifter, is that we actually have sort of a peaking week and we let somebody peak. If there's a meet in there, I peel off that last week and I throw the kind of meat prep those last two weeks. So I kind of deload going into the meet and then let them hit PRs and 
the meat day, mm-hmm. right? Rather than across the week. So that's block, right? Yeah. Block of volume, block of transition from volume to intensity where you're doing both. Final block is intensity only. So rather than maybe using the Russian words of accumulation, transmutation, realization, we can just say, look, the first block is volume. The middle block is both volume and intensity, and that's why the stress is so high. And the last one is intensity. And we lose the stress and hit the peak. That's yeah. The way, that's the way it works. And the term block really is really kind of misleading. It's, you know, it's a 8, 10, 12-week program cut up with one or two deloads. You just start with high volume and you just end up tapering down. That's right. Over the course of 12 weeks. Yep. That's all it is. But it makes sense to think about it like it's cut into segments by those deload weeks. Sure. But, that's, why, uh, yeah, that's why it feels that way. You actually have pre-planned deload weeks, mm-hmm. which maybe at Block might be the first time you've ever done that. Yeah. And I've probably had deload weeks with my clients by this point, but it's usually been because it was needed. Oops, time for deload week. Yeah. And we do that, but it's really pre-planned. And then here it is. I've had to add deload work in the block for guys that are in their 40s sometimes they can't do the three weeks yeah <laughs> sometimes two, they can't two do on the... two on deload week yeah, yeah i think that's fine nothing wrong with that yeah i've done a... the same thing with young kids and they they could go four or five weeks before they had to deload punks yeah, but yeah that's the, fine the point here is it's just like every other program we've talked about except for lp it's just a framework it's a way of thinking about it and then you can do jazz on the thing yep and you have to you yep. have to depending on who your lifter is you know if you've got a a fairly heavy guy who's in his late 40s and he's got a meet coming up you've got to watch him you may have to taper it more quickly and add more dewort load in there you just don't know and you got to watch yep. and uh that's why it's really great when you have somebody else watching you instead of doing it yourself because yep. it feels like that week two of transmutation you just don't think you're going to live right you think you're going to need like a leg transplant? Yeah, it's pretty, it's tough. Um, and we get real choosy with the supplemental lifts on this too. I don't, there's no reason to review this. You can go back and listen to the supplemental lift episode. But in block training, we're trying to pick supplemental lifts that specifically attack weaknesses of the lifter, mm-hmm. right? So if they struggle with the start of a deadlift versus the end of a deadlift, whatever those things are, if they struggle to keep the bar over the middle of their foot on a squat, then I'm going to pick supplemental lifts that try to correct those things. Or if they're fire out of the hole just fine and then they struggle halfway up, so I start to think about, like, where are the weaknesses of the lifter? What am I trying to build up first thing? I generally try to stick with big full range of motion movements for the supplemental lifts during the accumulation phase and go to more of the partial real heavy things by the end. Uh, that's it. Pretty easy. Yeah, I love it. There you have it. Yeah. If you've got any questions about this, gosh, we probably can't answer them for you in an email. You probably just need to go, which it's probably time, yeah, you know. That's true. But follow us on YouTube, like we always say. That is a show. Email us at barbellogic at barbellogicpodcast at gmail.com and let us know how we can help you out. Thanks. Thanks.